Good morning. We're talking today with Jeannie Kading and Guang Zhang. They're both very successful medical device project managers, and they also show up with an additional experience set that uh, we think would be very interesting to you, our audience. Uh, they have worked on managing the integration of a medical device company into uh, another medical device company, either a purchase or a merger. Both Jeannie and Guang come along with an additional experience set helping uh, clients manage the integration of a company into another company, both in the medical device field, not necessarily with medical devices. So this happens a lot. So it's an important topic, and especially for those who are being integrated and who are doing the integration. So let's start with a description of what m and activities actually entail. So let's assume for the sake of this argument that it's a medical device company and it's buying another company in the medical field, not necessarily medical device. Uh, what's needed to bring those two companies together for this to be a successful integration? So what examples of things do you guys suggest that are part of a typical integration activity? Larger company buys smaller company and they're being merged in. What are what sorts of things do what happens in an integration? You want to go first? Jeannie, yes. why don't you go first? Oh, I'll go first. Okay. Jeannie's first. So my experience is in companies who do software as a service for um, practitioners. And we would purchase very small companies. So in that particular instance, the most important thing to be concerned about in the process of integration was the people. Often these small companies had 10, 20, 30 employees. They felt like a family. And they were being swallowed up, as it were, by a larger company. And they were very unsure about what their place would be in that company um, and very doubtful uh, about the whole process. So it was very important to get those people on board as quickly as possible, given, of course, that they would usually be unaware that this was happening until the day that it was completed and signed off on, and ensuring that the things that they care about in their day-to-day -day life, their paycheck, their benefits, their retirement plans, were ported over as quickly and cleanly as possible. Guang, well, some areas that you would suggest uh, someone should actually be very aware of, and so how did you do it? Yeah, um, HR is definitely a very, very important aspect. Um, actually, in my in one of my experiences, that's an area that we did not do very well, and uh, so it caused caused some troubles. And uh, I think from a PM perspective, a very clear goal needs to be established. Sometimes a larger company do not want to do full integration. You are a part of us potentially do business as us, but you do everything you used to. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we want it. We want to leave you alone. We want to continue to practice how you practice. Uh, that's one way. Another way is full integration, right? You will wipe out all your, all the ways that you used to do business. You completely come to this family. And in that instance, often in the medical device world, right, you have to do submission and so forth as you're basically doing copy and paste, right? So it's very complicated. And in that situation, that if you were to do some layer of integration, then you have to decide how far you want to go. And in one scenario, you could do a phase-based integration where you say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna integrate the, the sales and um, distribution layer, you know, the front end, the back end, quickly. So from client perspective, from hospital perspective, you are part of that big company now. And, uh, but everything else is still here. You know, you as a larger company is buying a widget from a smaller company and selling it to a client. So all of a sudden you're going through me now. And, and then the next phase potentially is do more, do more, do more, and then eventually it's all in, right? So a project manager really need to know um, if I'm integrating 
and how far do you want me to integrate? What are the limitations? What are the budget constraints? Mm -hmm. um, when, when you are doing integration, it's a big change, right? You're changing from your leatherhead to my leatherhead. If you're doing that change, how much improvement do you want me to in, in, implement, right? Everyone's has grand ideas. It's, we're making a change anyways. You're doing submission to all the different regulatory bodies anyways. Can I merge in this long list of things I always thought of, always wanted to do? Is that, is that in the card? Is that a possibility? So all that, I think a grand vision of uh, and strategy of the integration phases and steps is really critical. Yeah, and sometimes that's not figured out prior to signing on the dotted line. Wow. So <clears throat> the first few weeks or months, depending on the size of the integration, you're still figuring out that strategy and making those decisions. And those can sometimes change on the fly. Yep. We think that we want to integrate this particular system into our system, and then as the actual tactical focused people start digging into it they realize hmm, this is a much bigger challenge than we thought it was and our idea that we were going to do this in the first three months well now we're going to do it in the first year very exciting it is exciting Project it's very dynamic on the fly yeah <laughs> it is isn't yeah, it? Right. <laughs> yeah. so you guys have a taste of genie and guang now so let's let's do some quick introductions so um I'm Tom Waddell, CEO of Waddell Group. We do project management consulting. Jeannie? I'm Jeannie Kading, and I also do project management consulting, mostly through Tom's group. Guang Zhang, same. I'm doing um, project management consulting through Tom's group as well. Great. So I'm an electrical engineer, and let's see if I remember correctly, you're a mechanical? Um, no, software. Software engineer. Mm -hmm. and mechanical. Well, mechanical engineer. All right. So we, we all have. Uh, Technical background, mm -hmm. so which is useful. Well, let's let's get into the meat of, of this a little bit. Um, how do you actually start? So you're assigned to a, a merger, and it happens. What do you what do you do first? Why don't you get started oh, first? Start? Yeah. Typically, what we've done is meet with the leadership and figure out what the goals are. Mm -hmm. And once you've done it once or twice, you kind of know what questions to ask to tease out the bigger picture strategy and, uh, and some of the directional uh, ins and outs to, to get this thing going. And then the immediate next steps to figure out who your contact persons are, uh, especially on the acquired company side. Mm -hmm. Who are you going to ask questions to? Who are you going to bother to get things rolling? Those are the, typically the first steps. So you're defining the project, as it were, and your team members. Who, who's really going to do the work on both sides? Yeah. Okay. Typically, I've seen, I've done it, I would consider it a not so efficient way. It's a lot easier to drum up the uh, the team on our own side, right? You know who you need and you need, you know the functions and the team members potentially. All of a sudden you have an army of members on your own side ready to go. And you have no idea what you're dealing with on the other side. And then you have the same person, maybe three person, that all these 20 people needs to ask questions on. And then you just bombard them with questions mm -hmm. and then they jam them up because they have, still have a day job to do and they still have to run the business. So that could be a, a, a pitfall, potentially. Okay. It is. All right. Um, anything to add for that? Um, if you're fortunate, on your side, your functional leaders who are you know, your, really your team members, whether they're a leader or just the person who's executing, has their own uh, checklist. So their own list of these are the things with my particular function that I need to be concerned about in um, any merger. And that's a starting point for them, um, including prioritization of that checklist. Ideally, they have prioritized it so they aren't necessarily driving their counterparts at the acquired company completely crazy with continuous questions. In my um, previous role doing this, that was part of one of the that was part of what I was responsible for was helping to sort of manage that communication flow so that it wasn't just 
these, these poor folks on the side of the acquired company getting questions from 12 different people, often repetitive questions. So we try to do things like have a kickoff meeting with the various functions and their counterpart to, to introduce, because often these people have never met each other before. They just found out, both of them sometimes a day ago, that this was happening. Well, let's go ahead and get you introduced and get you started talking to each other. Um, and then as a PM, my role was to facilitate that and facilitate this communication and try to streamline it as much as possible so that there was uh, less repetition, less duplication, um, less uh, somebody getting asked about something and saying, you're the fourth person to ask me that and it's been done for two weeks, that kind of thing. Yeah, which happened. <laughs> which happened. Yeah. So setting up the communication strategies mm -hmm. and pathways is a very important yes. piece of this. It really okay. is. Um, are there any other uh, suggestions you have regarding communication strategies? Mm -hmm. Do you guys do special reports or? Not really a special report, just really trying to track open questions by function. Okay. That was right. one thing that um, I did in my last integration was keep this kind of huge spreadsheet with you know, a tab for each function with a list of open questions that was accessible to everyone. Okay. So it wasn't you know secret or mine or anything like that. It was so accessible. Have a special to tool for that. Yes, it's called Excel. <laughs> <laughs> it's everybody's special tool, right? All right. Okay. <laughs> Anything we had, you had the one of the experiences that I had was we actually introduced a fairly large software tool from IBM called MA Accelerator. Wow. It was it was more taxing than than the good it's doing from my personal opinion. I thought. Um, so Excel might have been a better tool than Yes and no. Uh, Supposedly, it's a web-based tool where everyone have easier access. But then, you know, your your organization is learning this new tool while executing a very mm -hmm. very high-profile project, very complicated, right? So you kind of tax in the team with two things all at once, and uh, there's already communication communication challenges, and then you're layering it with this tool. I'm familiar with the tool, uh, um, so it was a uh, I think I think there was definitely room for improvement. Yeah. Um, don't don't bite off too too much on the future. <laughs> Make the tool the right size for the task mm -hmm. that you're actually taking on. It, it like could that. have been the right thing to do if the team was intimately familiar with it. Right? Okay, we're training. Yeah. yeah, it's it's probably designed for something like that because it already has a name of. Yeah, I'm an accelerator, right? Right. right? But no one knows how to use it, and there's too many buttons. And once you have information in there, no one knows how to back it out. And uh, so it's very, very complicated and cumbersome to use. Another tool um, that I didn't get an opportunity to use for integration, but I did do the implementation of the tool, um, is one by a company called Nubexo. Um, so my last few months at my last job, um, that was focused on mergers and acquisitions, I was moving towards the pre-acquisition phase, so all of the due diligence and all that, and the company decided to purchase this tool by me back, so we implemented. And the last project that I did was actually this implementation, and it would manage all the way from um, identifying companies that we were interested in through integration, and um, never got a chance to use it. It was okay. set up to be used. It was, and it seemed, it okay. was a, seemed to be right size for the size of the company that we were, which was smaller. Okay. <clears throat> there, there you go. A couple of good mm -hmm. tools. Um, what should someone that's jumping into project managing a merger and or acquisition know up front? So what are what were some of the biggest challenges? I think you've already mentioned a few of them. If you think about it, what, what would you have wanted to know before you decided to jump in and do a, the project management of one of these? <laughs> the amount of attention that the organization will pay to a merger, um, 
it's a lot. It's interest. a lot, yeah. So you might have a lot of senior leadership interest and um, assistance sometimes, which can be really great. And then sometimes it's like, oh, really, it's okay. We, it's under control. Um, there is a ton of money at stake. I mean, it's a lot of money at stake. The organization has invested a lot of money in this company. They want to start seeing a return on their investment that matches what they modeled when they were making the decision to move forward with this. Um, and that's often can be aggressive. And so, of course, they're going to pay attention. They want to see this be successful and they want to see it move as quickly as possible. Um, and depending on the organization, you know, they may have different kinds of willingness to throw money at solving problems that come up in integration quickly. So. Yeah, I think, I think in my experience, the early stage of a larger company started when the exercise in the, in the, in the M&A field, there's probably the general impression that uh, you just need a, potentially a project leader and the sum doers mm -hmm. and largely leverage our existing functional leadership as well as functional yeah. resources Squeeze to execute the, the, yeah. the integration. <laughs> um, therefore, you have basically people on both sides and the acquiring side and the acquired side doing the integration in their spare time, mm -hmm. right? And we all have so much of that. Yeah. And that's a, that's a big risk. Um, it is. Potentially, if you have a, a little bit of a headroom on your side, on the acquiring side, and on the acquired side, as typically a small company or startup, they are probably running very thin, very efficient, right? So they probably don't have that froth or headroom there to absorb that later. Uh, so that's a big risk. And then on the acquiring side, as you grow, uh, you know, you start off doing one M&A, all of a sudden you grow into 10, um, your 20% headroom can be a quickly eaten up, mm -hmm. right? Wow. That's a really good call out. It, yep. is, it is true. There are usually not dedicated resources for an integration. So it is people who have a job and now they need to do this too. Yep. So one of your suggestions would be to have the person jumping into this kind of job really lobby for getting some dedicated resources. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Okay. Or at least, at a very minimum, make sure that as you're planning, yep. that there's a clear understanding that, yes, we really need 20 hours a week of this particular functional person, but we're only going to get three. And yeah. that makes a difference. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. A, a lot of times that is unknown until you're very far into it. So as a PM, I will go a long time in an in in integration project without even having full understanding of my scope. Because I, I know the larger goal of integrating this company to a certain um, level, but I don't know what it takes because I don't know what the gaps are, um, mm -hmm. right? So I will potentially spend weeks and months of studying what the differences are and therefore how to reconcile them. And once I find out the differences, I have to come up with a solution first before I can forecast how much resource I need, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that, that solution is very, very difficult to come up with. You have to make compromises and so forth, right? And that's where the guiding strategy of, okay, am I, just trying to make it work, or am I improving it? Right, those are two different goals. Mm -hmm. um, if I was just trying to make it work, then I will make a, I will be willing to adopt a very mediocre solution to bridge the gap. Right, I have a gap. I need a cup of water. I don't need a full blown dispenser here. I could walk three blocks to get a cup of water and get mission accomplished. Right. right. Down the road, if you want to upgrade, that's that's a different project. Right. So if you're doing more than just one integration and you want to improve, that's a different that's a different story. Yep, yep. But often you get a lot of pushback and you say, okay, I used to have a water dispenser, now you're taking it away and you're asking me to walk a mile. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
So uh, if I were to summarize so far, a project manager on a mergers and acquisitions project is very high visibility. Yep. You don't really know the definition of the project until it really starts to unfold. Yep. You have the acquiring team didn't know this was happening until potentially the day it begins. Yep. And uh, so the definition's changing and you have to react. And you don't necessarily have dedicated resources to accomplish this uh, very high profile, uh, very cost, uh, very important project for a company. Yep. So sounds, uh, Sounds challenging. Yeah. It so, is. but knowing that coming in could give you an advantage because you know this is going to be exciting for some period of time. Mm -hmm. So, last question: um, You're mostly through this, and you want to do a lessons learned. Is there a particular format that you would suggest uh, as a lessons learned for these kinds of projects, or or is this kind of a normal lessons learned kind of? approach when you get done with a project. Is there anything special for a mergers and acquisitions project that would be different? Um, the only thing that I did was for lessons learned that was maybe a little bit different is you end up with you know two sets of two sets of people in the lessons learned instead of it being this single internal project team. Now at this point they are all, all internal but you want to yes but you want to get these people back together and say, okay, what went well? And you want to hear it not just from the side of the company that is acquiring them, but you want to hear it from the side of the people being acquired. Hey, what went well for you? You can learn a lot, especially about how those first few weeks went. Because one of the things that is um, that makes it challenging in my mind is the fuzzy part of it, which is Generally, the first time these people meet you as the project manager is the same day or within 48 hours after they learned about it. They don't know if they're going to have a job in a week. They don't know. They don't know anything. And so there's an emotional component to it for them that can sometimes come out in odd ways. So lessons learned is a great opportunity for me as the project manager and the acquiring company to learn what did this look like to them on this side? What are they willing to share with us about, you know, this was really jarring when you did this. And uh, whenever, whenever you came to me after a week and said you need, to, you know, me to put in 20 hours of work to generate 43 deliverables to you, that was too much and it wasn't prioritized and you didn't do that. You can get that kind of information from people. Okay. Um, it can be, to me, it's kind of the interesting part because you really are you're dealing with folks' livelihood, um, especially in those first couple of weeks when they're still very uncertain of where they're going to end up. So you have to be aware of that, and you can learn some new ways to cope with that through a lessons learned process. Okay. Guang, any, anything with the lessons learned? Yeah. It's um, different. I think one big lesson is Still, even after COVID, after the um, work from home, Zoom, Teams, um, innovation, I'd say the technology just came a long ways. But even with that, um, don't discount the value of traveling there um, and meet the people, uh, be there. Just sometimes just be present. You know, I've, I'd go there, just sit in the cubicle. And although I don't have planned activities, just be there and so people could come up to you and ask questions and so forth um, versus um, being, on the, being on the phone or on the, on the team call all the time. I don't discount the, the effectiveness. It does, you do get things done on, online, but um, building that relationship, being there, it does help a lot. Right. They are part of your, your company now, so yep. treating them like uh, family or company members is yep. important. Yep. All right. Any questions from our studio audience? Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you very much for your attention on this great topic. Uh, thank you to Jeannie and Wong for providing feedback in this area. Uh, certainly if people
people that are watching this video have questions, please get a hold of us and you can ask direct questions to both me or Guan if you uh, care to do that. So thank you. Have a great rest of your day.